Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Welcome today. Welcome to this Wednesday Weekly Word. Amen. Uh, and I'm here to give you a good word. And we're going to be looking at prayer. As I said, continuing on prayer. For now, this will be the last uh, video on this series on prayer. I think I've done about four previously. Okay, so you can check that playlist of all uh, we've been touching on prayer. So today we're going to speak on um, the most important prayers. You know, the first of all prayers. As the Bible says, you know, there's certain things which have got priority over other things. And in prayer, yes, Jesus gave the pattern of prayer and all that, right? But now I want us to look at what is the most important prayer. The most important prayers, or can I rather say, the prayers which we ought to pray continuously and prioritize and put them as first, you know, as principle, as first, okay? And where we're going to find this is in 1 Peter chapter 2, right? So let's go there, 1 Peter chapter 2, from verse number 1. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all, you see, so this is the importance. It says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Okay. So, what does this mean? If you remember last week, I spoke on all kinds of prayer, the different kinds of prayer. And in here, you can see that the Apostle Paul, as he's led by the Holy Ghost, is saying, um, first of all, supplications. That's a type of prayer, right? <laughs> then he says, prayers, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So supplications, remember I said that's that heartfelt prayer. So he says you need a heartfelt prayer uh, from you. It needs to be made. That's a supplication. And prayer, well, there's many other kinds of prayer there. Then intercession. Remember I explained intercession is not just a prayer. But intercession is where there's a fight between two parties. And one comes in the middle to intercede, to make peace between the two. That's where we have Jesus Christ who ever lives to make intercession for us. He's the one who has made it possible isn't it? Through his death once on the cross. So this is for someone who is out of tune with God, is out of relationship with the Lord. Then you make intercession for them to be made peace, to be reconciled. Hallelujah. That is intercessions, right? And then giving of thanks for all men. So giving of thanks, remember I said it's thanking the Lord for in prayer for someone or whatever you received. Okay. So he says this should be done for all men. But then he mentions and he says for kings. And for those who are in authority so that we can live a life of peace. So in those days, they had kings that ruled. In our days, we have presidents, we have prime ministers. They are the ones who make certain laws and rules and all that, isn't it? So he says that we must prioritize praying for them. But I want you to understand this. Remember, from a kingdom point of view, right? Because here we are dealing with the, the kingdom of God. So he says for all men who are in authority, remember at the same time that you are a king priest, isn't it? So we are king priests. And then... Jesus established his church, isn't he? He said to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So first of all, I know it's often emphasized that these prayers ought to be for, you know, governmental leaders and all that. But I want to switch it around. Not necessarily I switching it around, but going according to the word of God, you know. You know, Jesus even uh, spoke a, a, a parable and he said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, isn't it? So it means that if the shepherd of the flock, that's like your pastor or your leader in the church, isn't it? In the kingdom, if there's a problem with them, then it causes a problem going down below. You know, one of the best teachers, I believe, on leadership is John C. Maxwell. And he says, whenever there's a problem in any organization or anything, a church, whatever it is, he says, don't look at the followers, whatever. He says, you don't need to deal with them. He says, go straight to the top, go straight to the head, because that's where everything, he says, everything rises and falls on leadership. That's why the Apostle Paul emphasizes we ought to pray for our leaders, those in authority. So I will say, you start off by praying for the authority in your church, the authority in the kingdom of God. You understand that? Because this is a spiritual uh, battle, a spiritual uh, thing which is going on, isn't it? So the enemy, as much as government leaders, they can, you know, they can make all kinds of decisions and that sort of thing. But it is more important to start in the church. 
which is the pillar and ground of truth, isn't it? The house of God, because we need the house of God, the kingdom of God to be flowing and to be functioning, the leaders to be uh, flowing and functioning, responding to the power of God, because they will come under attack. You understand this? They will come under attack from different forces, trying to, you know, compromise in whatever they do, trying to lead them astray so that the sheep can be led astray. You understand? So that's why we have to be in constant prayer for your leader, whether he's an apostle, prophet, you know, teacher, evangelist, pastor, wherever it is, all those leaders, the leaders of the worship team, the leaders of uh, evangelism team, you have to constantly keep them in prayer. Because when you pray, remember when I started this series on prayer, I said that God cannot do anything except, you know, someone prays. That's, I believe it was John Wesley's quote, isn't it? So it needs us to pray to bring down the power of God, isn't it? Because he has given authority onto us. So we have to, to use that authority through prayer to make, inter to make a request, sorry, to make requests of the Father to say, let our leaders continue in sound health. Let their marriages be blessed. Let, um, you know, their teaching be sound, led and inspired by you. You, you understand this? You know, we rebuke every attack against them, confusion, something trying to lead them astray, trying to tempt them into sin. We rebuke all those things, isn't it? In prayer. And we declare that they continually hear from the Lord and lead the people of God in the right way, with a soft heart, in gentleness and in truth, not compromising. This is how we ought to pray, always for your leaders. Because you can't every time be saying, you know, oh, this has happened, that has happened. You ought to pray, isn't it? I'm going to get into this and you're going to see. You'll say, how about this situation? How about that situation? As I touch today on this message, you're going to get the understanding. Okay, so that's the first part I will say is praying for the spiritual leaders, the leaders in the kingdom of God. But we cannot run away that the Apostle Paul here says, for kings, like I've explained to you, we are king priests. That's why I'm saying we can pray for our leaders in the church. But he is also clearly speaking of governmental leaders because he says that we may live a quiet and peaceful Life acceptable uh, for this is good and acceptable sight of God our Savior. Isn't it? Verse two for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So government leaders, look at 2020. What happened? Some of the decisions that were made there, <laughs> you can see it was inspired by the devil. There was nothing of God involved in in majority of those decisions which were made. You see, so I believe it was through the constant prayer of the saints that caused these leaders, their hearts to be changed, to say, ha -ha, wait a second, this science doesn't seem to be proper. We want to we change and, and we're making these decisions. So they lifted all those lockdowns and all those kind of uh, regulations. But it started from prayer because our government is above all other governments. That is the government of God, of the kingdom of God. You understand that? So that united prayer is what brought about a change. But we must pray for kings and government leaders. That's why it says, supplications that means your heartfelt prayer for them you know so that they can make decisions for the benefit of the gospel of jesus christ this is how you ought to pray you know it's not necessarily saying that when you pray pray oh oh lord bless my president give him long life yes you can pray that but the main thing is to pray that their heart be moved towards the people of god be moved towards the spreading of the gospel be moved towards you know allowing prosperity to flow and the best way for prosperity to flow in any nation is to allow the free preaching of the gospel. You understand that? The free preaching of the gospel. From there, all other things will come into line. You understand that? This is what I believe to be the truth. Yes, they can have many other policies, but the best policy is to back the true preaching of the gospel in a nation. And that nation will flourish without fail because the gospel brings all solutions. Governments are out there trying to work out peace and reconciliation uh, things and they're trying to work out you know how to bring prosperity to places how to stop fights and wars once the gospel of jesus christ is preached the heart of man is changed and solutions flow you understand that so we as a church should be an example but we pray for leaders and uh, for those governmental leaders to allow because remember we are ambassadors here we pray for them to allow the free preaching of the gospel that's why even there you can see he said for, for kings, for those in authority, and for all men. And we'll see that again in Ephesians. This is the one I touched on uh, last week, I believe it was. Ephesians chapter 6, right? Verse number 18. Let's see what does he say there. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That's being inspired by the Spirit of God in your prayers. 
and watching thereon with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You see that? So the Apostle Paul, when he said, you pray for all men, and he said, also pray for me. So even you, they're listening, watching to this, pray for me. The same way I request, even as Paul said, <laughs> that uh, my mouth may be opened to speak the gospel, uncompromised in truth, which is what he said, that he may be able to speak the gospel. And you, you could be like, but Apostle Paul, you are teaching, you're sending these letters, there's fire flowing from your mouth, you're moving with the Holy Ghost, you told us you're speaking tongues more than us all, and everything's flowing. But he said, no. Pray for me, for utterance to be given to me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery. For I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldness as I ought to speak. So some will say, oh, it's just because he was in prison and he's saying this. No, it wasn't just because of that. But he was asking for that prayer. He knows the power of prayer, isn't it? So we must pray for the preachers of the gospel isn't it? To declare the truth of the Word of God. Because when truth comes out, then come solutions, isn't it? When there's lies coming out or compromising of truth, a mixture between the two, then comes problems. You understand this? So we must continue to pray for the preachers of the gospel and pray for the leaders of nations to allow for the preaching of the gospel. This is the main thing. When you pray for your leaders, you know, you can say, oh, let's pray we have a water crisis or we have a economic crisis, we have a health crisis, whatever crisis in the nation, and you're praying for the minister of health and you're praying for it, start by praying for the preachers of the gospel, that they can open their mouth boldly and preach the gospel of truth. Then pray for those leaders of nations to allow the free course and the free preaching of the gospel, isn't it? And also pray for the leaders of nations to do what the Lord requests of them, isn't it? If they're unsaved, realize it's, it's not for you. At times, many people, what happens is they make this mistake. They get a leader maybe who's a Buddhist or Muslim or whatever. And they say, remove him by fire, by thunder, by force. Remove this president. He is not born again and all this. But I can tell you, and I've seen it and I've witnessed even in current times, some nations have had born again, uh, Holy Ghost full, tongue speaking leaders. But they put the nation in disarray and making decisions even against the gospel. Yet that leader is filled with the Holy Ghost and probably is praying in tongues even in the morning. But because of all these contrary spirits, he himself is not aware of um, the decisions that he was making that were hindering the gospel, you see. And then someone will pray for to, to, to have that kind of a leader who's filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, they can be filled with the Holy Ghost, but there's other forces which come uh, to, to push them aside, isn't it? So even if your leader is not born again, it does not mean that God cannot speak to him. We saw it in the Old Testament many times where the Lord spoke to unbelievers and caused them to make decisions. You look at uh, King Cyrus, you know, made a decree that the temple of God should be built. That was, and he was the Persian king. And that I believe is modern day uh, Iran, if I'm not mistaken. So he wasn't even like a Jew or worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he said they must have their temple, the temple must be built. And I'll show you some other examples as well. So the main thing, pray for your church leaders, your pastor, and all that, and then pray for your president of the nation, of each uh, ministry department and all that, because they have the authority, they make decisions, and those decisions affect the lives of many people. So we must keep them in prayer, in supplication. If they're not born again and they're not uh, in right standing with the Lord, this is when we intercede for them to say, let them get that relationship of, with Christ. Because that's what we desire for them to get to worship the Lord God in truth, isn't it? So he said prayers, So he said supplication. So that's your own heartfelt prayer to pray that God can use your leader for the benefit of the people, for the prosperity of the nation, the furtherance of the gospel. He said prayers, that's again all different kinds of prayers. Intercessions, so if they're not born again, you pray that they can get into a relationship with Christ, isn't it? Because when they have a relationship with Christ, their soul is saved, and at the same time, they can hear more clearly from the Lord. Then he said giving of thanks. So when your leader makes a decision, like when they lifted the lockdowns, you know, say, okay, churches can meet unlimited and all this kind of thing, that decision, you know, you ought to be thankful and you thank the Lord for your leader, especially like in the in the United States. I saw many governors, they, especially in Florida, I believe it was Florida and Texas, they had already lifted all those uh, uh, restrictions very early. 
So that's why I believe the people in those states ought to have, and I believe they did, give thanks for the governor. Give thanks, say, Lord, thank you for the governor. So even when your president or governor or minister makes a certain decision, which is in line with the spreading of the gospel, in line with freedom for, for the people, isn't it? Then you ought to be thankful. You give a prayer of th thanks. You say, thank you, Lord, for my president. He did this thing. Thank you, Lord, for that. And then the Lord, he will actually add more grace and mercy upon that leader to make such decisions again, isn't it? So that is the giving of thanks. And we've got to pray for the free course of the gospel. You understand that? All those nations where there's restrictions against the gospel, if you are in such a nation, keep praying for your leaders to lift. Because, you know, when the pressure comes, <laughs> they can't hold back. And it just needs one leader to come and to change that law and say, right, I'm going to allow this free speech on, on preaching. You understand that? And then from there, so many doors are opened, isn't it? By your prayer for that leader. So it's not always to pray for the removal of that leader, but it is to pray that they make decisions which will allow the gospel of Christ, for them to receive Christ, and most importantly, to make decisions for the spreading of the gospel. And it is possible, you know, because like, uh, and remember, why we say we pray for those in authority and for kings? Because they are the ones who have, they've got, you know, authority. It's not necessarily physical power or might, but they have the right to, to summon power. They have the right to wield power, isn't it? To bring about changes. This is why we pray for them, isn't it? If the president says something in a nation, the entire, all the resources of that nation get moving to see that that thing is fulfilled, <laughs> isn't it? Like Ecclesiastes, and you are also a king, uh, that's why he said kings. That's why he said also pray for all saints. But we must emphasize we're starting with those who have authority. Because your prophet, your apostle, whoever in the church, your pastor, has been given that authority. So whether you think you are wiser than them, or you are, you are more anointed for them than them, or whatever it is. But at that point in time, they are the one who the Lord has put in authority in that place. You don't go against that authority. You pray for that authoritative figure to make decisions in line with the Spirit of God, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 8, because one day you're going to be the one in authority as well, and you're going to want people to pray for you to make the right decision. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? So this is exactly what happens when we speak of leadership and authority. A, a leader can make a decision, you know. It's not that they're a dictator, but that decision, okay, some are dictators, but... <laughs> Majority of time, once a leader makes that decision or they have the authority to sign that thing uh, as a law or whatever or make a, an instruction, this is how we're going to do things in the church, they're inspired um, by the Lord or inspired by whatever, the advisors and all this. No one can come and say, what are you doing? You see, because they are the one in charge. They are the leader. They are the one who's setting the way things should be done. So no one can come and challenge them. This is why it's important to uh, challenge them legally and lawfully, I mean in terms of the authority. Yes, people can challenge, but I'm talking of the authority which is in place at that time. No one can challenge them, they follow them. It's just like how soldiers are trained, I believe, is that even when there's a coup, if a coup takes place in a nation, because the soldiers are trained to support the government that is in power of the day, the moment um, that government changes, they could be supporting the sitting president, even if he's still under attack in the coup, but once it's made official that, okay, he's been removed, this guy is now in control, this is now in charge, this is now the leader, then they have to sit and they have to follow and support uh, that leader, isn't it? That is the flow of authority, okay? And most importantly, I must touch on this, is speaking against leaders. Because if you're going to pray for your leader, you cannot now speak against your leader. You understand that? If you're going to be giving thanks and wanting your leader to do something well, you cannot be speaking against them or challenging them. You know, this is really mainly on understanding authority. Authority is a whole other topic, but we have to touch it here because we're praying for those in authority. These are the first primary prayers we ought to pray. So we must understand um, how to deal with uh, authorities. And like I said to you, authority, those are the people who are in power. We cannot challenge them because they've been given that authority, whether it's from God. In fact, it is from God. And um, if it's not from God, they will be removed, isn't it? And then we go to Exodus. Let's check this out so I can see, because it says we should not speak against our leaders. Exodus 22, hallelujah, verse number 28. It says, you shall not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler 
of your people. So you should not curse the ruler of your people. Now the ruler of your people here, let me explain. You are, if you are born again, you are part of the kingdom of God. So you don't curse the ruler of your people. And who, yes, we know Jesus is the ruler and all that. But there are these other gifts that he has given and authoritative figures he has given in each place. Even if it's a branch pastor in that branch, you cannot come if you are a member in that branch and you start speaking bad against the pastor or you start uh, speaking evil against the pastor. You might say, oh, you don't know what they did. They did this. I'll show you what you do when those things happen, right? But you are, first of all, to pray for them, isn't it? To go in supplication with a heartfelt prayer to say, Lord, correct them in this thing. There's a problem in this department. You pray for the leaders of those departments so that things can be moved around and changed. Not to go out and start sitting there amongst the saints and say, you know, this pastor, yeah, what they've been doing and what they haven't been doing. And you go on and on and say, ah, the pastor, you see, that's not what you should do. You start off in prayer. Maybe you say, ah, I've prayed, I've prayed. They're not changing. I'll show you what, what we do in such situations. But the main thing, you don't speak against the rule of your people. I want to show you, even if they've done something wrong. You're going to say, what? I'll show you. In public, you don't go in and challenge them. Let's go to Acts. All right. Now, remember, I'm starting and I'm saying the leaders. I'm talking of in the kingdom of God. Right. Let's go to Acts uh, chapter 23. Because when you're going to pray for them, you can't pray and then go and speak against them afterwards, isn't it? Let's go to Acts chapter 23. This was the Apostle Paul from verse number... <coughs> Let me see where I take it from. Let's take it from verse number one, right? And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Verse two. And the high priest, who was this? This was the high priest. So he was in... Uh, authoritative position in the church of that time, isn't it? And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth, to hit him on the mouth, right? Verse 3, Then Paul said unto him, God shall smite you, you whited war, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and command me to be smitten contrary to the law. Look at this. Paul answered, there was a man there who said, clap this guy. Paul said, I've lived in all honesty and good conscience before all men. Then he was commanded to be smacked. And then he answered the one who commanded him to be smacked and said, God will, smi will, will smack you. You know, to say, and he was saying like, why are you commanding me to be hit against the law? He was like, it's not lawful, even according to the law. You understand? Paul knew the law in and out. So Paul was like, who is this guy who's, is, what he's doing is wrong. You know, it's like maybe if you're in a church and then they kick you out or something like that or they tell you to move to the back, yet you've done nothing wrong or something, isn't it? Whatever it is, whatever the decision the leader has made is a wrong decision. It's not based on truth. And you know it, that it's not based on truth. So Paul was sitting there and he's like, hey, this guy is telling me to be hit. I've done nothing wrong. So he answered back. He was, according to him, he was being mistreated and ill-treated, which truly he was being mistreated and ill-treated because it was wrong for him to be commanded to be smacked because he did nothing wrong. So he was like, hey, who are you to say that I should be smacked? God will smack you because you're commanding me to be smacked for nothing. So he was actually saying what was true, right? But look at this, verse number four. And they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? Look at this. So the ones who were standing by, they said to him, are you going against God's high priest? You see, even though the high priest was wrong, but the ones around, they looked, they said, ah, the high priest said we must make, are you going against God's high priest? Look at this. Verse 5. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. So you are saying, I didn't know he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. That was the ruler in the church, and it was amongst all the followers were there. You understand the setting. All the followers were there, the high priest is there, and he is is under the high priest authority at that time isn't it so you understand that he then backed back and said okay i didn't know he was the high priest and he didn't now challenge him again and say ah whether he's the high priest or who he is doesn't he know i met jesus on the road and jesus is now my high priest and he must get out no he didn't he didn't speak against him so understand that that um this is the contest of not speaking against your leaders you pray for your leaders, even if they make a mistake, but you don't challenge their authority, especially amongst people. Even if there's something wrong, don't go and speak to them 
now in front of everyone and say, oh, we've seen this thing. This thing has been going on for a long time. And what are you doing about it? You see, even though you're saying you're coming in honesty, but it's not the way to go about it. If you've prayed on it, it's not the way to go about it. Let me show you. We're speaking on that, first of all, prayer. And the first things we deal with is leadership. Praying for leaders, praying for those in authority. I'll get to the one about uh, kings. You'll see something amazing. Okay, let's go to First Timothy. First Timothy is so powerful. We were there just now. First Timothy 5, verse number 9. No, no, no. First Timothy 5, verse number 9, 19. Right. So this is when your leader, maybe something has come up, they've done something wrong or whatever it is, and people start gossiping and scandal. Because things can happen. Like I said, you know, a leader can fall or whatever it is. But the word of God says, a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up again. So what do you do now when a leader, I'm talking of in the kingdom, something has happened, there's something going on, there's a scandal, or, you know, stories are going around, people are seeing things are happening. What do you do in such a situation? And this has happened to me many times, so I've always taken to this scripture. And I quote the scripture to the person who brings the story to me. 1 Timothy 5, 19 says, Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So most of the time, the person will come to me, one person, with the story. And I tell them, I can't even receive your story because you are one witness alone. So I said, you need to bring another witness, two or three, then I can maybe hear what you're saying. But I will not even receive, meaning I won't even entertain your conversation about that story. You understand this? You remember the issue that took place with, with Moses. We saw that at the same time, where Miriam was going on and on about uh, Moses's marriage. Uh, to the Egyptian lady and she got struck with leprosy. So she was one. So already she was wrong because she needed a second person to back her up in her story. Maybe if she had a second person to say, Moses, what is done with the, the Egyptian, marrying the Egyptian woman is wrong. Then maybe she wouldn't have had leprosy. But she came alone and she was bold enough alone to speak against the leader of, of uh, the people of God. You understand it. So even if someone has done something wrong, don't receive that story. You know, you can just read articles or hear things and whatever. Don't even receive it. But it must be at least two witnesses to come and tell you, this is what happened with this person and whatever, and they stand firmly. Then this is when the Bible says, then you can receive. But now, what do you do now? Receiving means you say, okay, I'm acknowledging what you're saying. This is what this person has done. Okay, there's a problem here. There's an issue. Now, how do you solve it? Remember, we're talking on praying for leaders and all that. So these things come up when you're praying for leaders because you be like, oh, this one did this, this one did that, right? That's why I'm touching on this. And I'm talking of the kingdom of God. So you don't speak against your leaders, even though you've heard whatever. You don't go against them, right? And then coming back now, once... If the accusation, you don't receive an accusation, one person, let it be two or more witnesses. Then you can say, okay, now I acknowledge there's this issue. I'm hearing what you're saying. Now, how do you deal with it? First Timothy 5 verse 1. It says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. So it means even you're praying on this issue. So you don't now go like how the apostle Paul rebuked that high priest in front of everyone. You see, that's why he backed down afterwards. After having rebuked that high priest or whatever, he backed down and said, okay, I didn't know you were the high priest. And he didn't continue challenging. So even when you've now had this accusation against a leader or whatever in the kingdom, and two or more people come, um, and they come and they tell you that thing, if you have the, the opportunity, you continue in prayer, but if you have the opportunity to speak to that person or whatever it is, you do not rebuke them. You understand? Even though they're wrong. Look at what David did with Saul. Every time they came, David knew Saul was in the wrong place. Isn't it? He knew Saul was in the wrong place, but he never agreed with the guy Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, I've seen it. He's wrong. Yeah, we've got to kill him. He said, okay, he's in the wrong place, but God is the one who has anointed him. You understand? So the main thing, we're not running away from the thing, but like I'm saying, if you are able to have an audience with that lead after you've been praying for them and all that, now the thing you do, you don't rebuke them in front of everyone. Say, hey, listen up here. Uh, we've been, we've heard this story has happened with you, Pastor. And uh, can you please explain to us what's going on? Maybe you say you open it at a leaders' meeting. No, you don't do that kind of thing. You understand? You speak to them in honesty and in truth, alone, one on one. Say, Pastor, these uh, you don't even have to tell the people the names. Really. Are these some couple of people came towards me with this accusation, and I've been hearing the stories, but you know, I don't. I'm not speaking against you. I'm praying on the issue, but what is it? 
That's when we go to Matthew 18. Here's a conflict resolution. You can go. Okay, must we go there? Okay, let's go there. So this is what you do. You don't rebuke the elder, isn't it? But you entreat them as a father. You understand? With respect. So it's mostly one-on-one. Say, what's the issue? And they have the right, if they tell you, leave it alone. Don't, whatever. Once it's something of God, you understand? You don't need to get to know all the details, whatever. You've done your part. Matthew 18 tells us how this thing works. Matthew 18, uh, verse number 15. So now maybe you, you have prayed for this leader, you've continued to pray for them, and um, you've now even uh, you've had witnesses come to you, told you this is the story, and then now you are going to you, you address the leader, or whatever it is, and maybe there's no peace there. And the leader says, no, it's my own story, leave it alone, or whatever. This is how you overcome it. Matthew 18, 15 says, Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, and if he shall hear you, you have gained your brother. Or in this case, you've gained your leader. He says, but if he will not hear you. So this is now when now you have the right afterwards. But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or, or one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. You see, so you're not creating a scandal. But if there's an issue, there's an issue. But you're not creating a scandal. And this is how you go about it. And if you shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if you shall neglect to hear the church, then let him be unto you as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So that's the agreement of things, but done the right way. So you don't go and rebuke an elder in front of everyone. Perhaps that thing they've done wrong, they've already repented of it. And now you are coming to come and expose the sins. Remember, the word of God says love covers a multitude of sins, isn't it? You, you understand that. So it's not about openly exposing. That's why you can see all these scriptures I've been reading to you. It says one-on-one. It says there's a, an issue, go and discuss it one-on-one. If he doesn't want to hear you, bring a witness. Say, right, I want to talk to you this issue. If they don't want to hear you, then afterwards he says you tell the two or three, then you can leave it. You understand? But... When an accusation comes against the leader, except before two or more witnesses, don't even entertain it. Even though you may have heard words floating around, but if they don't come as witnesses to testify towards you, don't even entertain it. I understand. But at the same time, always, even if the person confesses, okay, I did this wrong and that leader has fallen or whatever, continue to pray for them, isn't it? And if they've gone away off of God, then you now you've got to intercede for them. You understand that? intercede for them and even give thanks for them to say lord but they have done this in your kingdom i thank you for all the good work they've done isn't it? it's for their restoration because the whole thing is about restoration isn't it? restoration of all things restoration that's what it's about so now what about speaking against these government leaders and because uh, you'll be like ah oh, my government is corrupt they rigged elections they've done this what about that i would say at the same time uh, it says don't speak against the leader of your people. So if you're a citizen of that nation, it wouldn't be wise for you to start running a YouTube channel speaking all the wickedness against your president or that kind of thing because you're actually embarrassing yourself even though you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. But if you are part in that nation, it's not putting your nation in a good light. So I wouldn't advise you to do that. But that being said, <laughs> which I believe is still true, we see Jesus rebuked leaders. Even the prophets, they rebuked kings and all that. We even see Jesus, uh, Luke chapter 13. This was politics. People say don't get into politics. He spoke out against a politician. He spoke out against a leader of people. Luke 13. Okay, verse 31. says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, saying unto Jesus, Get you out and depart hence, for Herod will will kill you. As was King Herod. And he said unto them, Go you and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. Look at that. So Jesus sent a message of rebuke against uh, King Herod. He said, Go and tell that fox, I'm doing this and that. And after that, you see, then he said he will leave or whatever it is. You, you get this. So he was not quiet to speak out against <laughs> That lead. And then we even have John the Baptist, who, when there was an issue with this, I believe it was the same uh, character, King Herod, Matthew chapter 14, right? Again, you say, oh, you don't get involved. This prophet, John the Baptist, got involved in what was going on, isn't it? 
Let's read it from here. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 verse 1. At that time, the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, and he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist, he is risen from the dead, and, th and therefore mighty works to show forth themselves in him. But I want from verse 3, right? Let's take it from verse 3. For Herod had laid hold on John, and bound him, and put him in prison. Right? For Herod, de for Herodias' sake, his brother, Philip's wife. So Herodias was the lady who was his brother's wife. Verse 4. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for you to have her. So John said to this king, You are taking your brother's wife. It's wrong. It's not right. Now Herod wasn't a Jew, neither was he under the law of the Jews. But John was saying, Morally, it's not right. You are taking your brother's wife. Verse 5. And when he would not have put him to death, you see, so the king wanted to kill John the Baptist. We're talking of an authoritative figure. When he, had, when, he could not, when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So because the people, remember he's a leader of the people, King Herod. And then, so okay, the people see this guy as a prophet. I can't kill him. I don't agree with him, but I can't kill him. Because the people are declaring he's a prophet. So even King Herod in his authority, he had to hands off of John. <laughs> you understand this. So that shows you the authority of the kingdom of God is always higher than the authority of the kingdoms of men. Because he couldn't touch John the Baptist. Right. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herod, Herodias, Herodias, whatever, danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised them an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. So remember, where the word of a king is, there is power. That's why we said they have authority. When they say something, they, it sticks. No one can say to him what it is. So he swore, he gave an oath. He said, whatever she asks, I'll give it to her. Verse 8, and she being before instructed of her mother, so the one who was the, who was the adulteress, isn't it? Who was taken away from uh, this king's brother and came to the king. This lady now, Herodias, whatever, had instructed the daughter to say, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. Look at verse number 9. I want you to see it so you understand why we ought to always pray for leaders. It says, and the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison. Look at that. Verse 9 says, the king was sorry. Meaning the king was sorrowful. He was like, what have I done? Because he made an oath and he knew once he makes the oath, authority has to flow. You understand? Authority has to flow. So this is why we always have to pray for leaders. So, King Herod was like, I've made a mistake. He didn't want John to be killed. Even though at first he wanted John to be killed, but he realized this guy is a prophet, I can't kill him. So he just said, I'll put him in prison. But now because he made an oath, now someone comes to deceive him. You see how the devil works. That's why we always must pray for our leaders and those in authority. Because the devil is always coming to those, to get into those in authority, to change them, to make decisions. You understand? To make decisions to, to some law. And, may, and the person will be like, how did I even make such a law? I don't even know how I did that. You see, it's because of the foul influence which is coming upon them. We see this throughout the Old Testament, even modern time. You see. And this is what happened. The king was sorrowful. And then what happened? John the Baptist was beheaded. The king didn't want him beheaded. But because the king uh, had made that decision foolishly, that's what happened, isn't it? You remember even when Peter was put in prison, the plan was afterwards to kill Peter. Because John was beheaded, but the plan afterwards was to kill Peter. But the church prayed and caused for Peter to be released. So that's why you ought to pray. Because remember, Peter was a leader in the church. So you pray for your leader. Don't be like, oh, he's going through such trouble, sickness and everything. Oh, and his such persecution. Oh, that leader, may make, make, make God do something. You say, no, you don't say that. You inter you pray. Heartfelt pray. Isn't it? You come and you say, Lord, restore them. We rebuke that sickness. We come against this persecution. Let him not grow weary, uh, even though what people are speaking against him or her, whatever it is. Let them not grow weary. Let them continue preaching the gospel. Open their mouth with boldness to declare the gospel, isn't it? And then you see the strength coming. And people's lives are benefited because of all of a leader. Some people are so much, uh, you know, that's why I say never be too stuck to a leader. But... We must understand that leaders are leading people. And many people, they, they have been won over by a person, you see. That's why we have to continue to intercede 
uh, if they make a mistake, that is, if they fall away from God. But we must, more importantly, continue to pray for them that the power of God works through them, isn't it? Because they could have led someone to Christ and then they're like a hero to someone. And then now when they see that person falls, this is the guy who showed me the way. Now he's gone astray. Ah, this whole thing is fake, you see. So we don't want that kind of thing. That's why we continue to pray for leaders in the kingdom of God that they remain standing as well to pray for your president, your governor, your headmaster, your teacher, your lecturer, your boss at work. I remember when I was employed, I would always uh, pray for the boss. And then decisions would be made, you know. And I wouldn't have to always come back and say, you know, I prayed for this thing. But I'll just be quiet and I'll be like, yes, Lord, I'll give praise and glory to the Lord to say thank you. That thing has happened. People have received bonuses. You understand? The boss just decides, okay. And it won't be that he's just deciding, but someone or somewhere praying, you understand, for things to be, to be done. So everyone can have peace in the workplace. That's what you can do. Even at the school, maybe your headmaster is frustrated with an issue. Now he's just caning every student, giving them <laughs> the corporal punishment. And then you just intercede for the headmaster, get his relationship with Christ, or you pray for him if he's born again, that he can you know, be merciful and allow things to flow. Then you realize he's now a happy, joyful headmaster. And nobody's getting cuts every time he's found a way to discipline people and the children. Everyone is happy, the staff members are happy. Teachers are happy, things are flowing, isn't it? You can control situations, isn't it? You can control situations by praying for your leaders. Proverbs 21 verse 1. Because when you pray for your leaders, this is what happens. Let me show you. Proverbs 21 1. Don't just sit back and say, oh, they're a monster. The monster can be changed into something powerful. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Hallelujah. So as you pray and intercede, the Lord, just like water, it changes the heart of the king. Changes the heart. Even that person can be, you know, like I'm saying at times, they're not even born again or they don't even have a relationship with the Lord. But as you intercede for them, right? You pray for them to make decisions in line with the kingdom of God. They just start making decisions. Whether they're all corrupt politicians, got in through rigging, but, and they just want to eat the money or whatever, but you pray that whatever decision they make there is going to benefit the preaching of the gospel and benefit the peace and prosperity of the land. And you see that will start to happen, isn't it? If they go against that thing, then they'll be kicked out. They'll be removed and the Lord will replace them with someone else. You know, we see many of these uh, these. Uh, these uh, stories in the Bible, you can read them. Like in Esther chapter 3, we have the issue of Haman versus Mordecai. Now Haman was, was promoted uh, under the king and he was jealous of Mordecai because he thought Mordecai didn't respect him or honor him. So he went forward, put a plan and he made, uh, he told the king, there's some people here who their customs and ways are against you, your nation and all this. And he, he influenced the king wrongly, isn't it? And he said, let the Jews be wiped out. The king didn't even know. He just he was saying, okay, this is my advisor. Whatever he says, okay, there's my ring. There's my signet. Go and whatever you decree. There's my signet. Put my seal. Knowing once that seal is put, the king agrees with it. You know, and you can have this in schools, in workplaces, in churches. You know, we saw it with uh, Jezebel, who was influencing uh, the king the wrong way, isn't it? To say, oh, they must worship Baal and all this. Even Solomon was led astray by women. You understand that? So they come to influence the king. This is what the enemy always does. He comes to influence, trying to get influence. That's why even Satan went to Eve. The attack always comes through the, some of the deadliest attacks, I'm sorry to say, but they always come through women. Comes and influences Eve so that Eve can get to the authoritative figure who is the man. There comes Eve. She's Because notice when Eve ate the fruit, nothing happened. She didn't notice that she was naked or whatever. Nothing happened. But when she gave to the man who was the authoritative figure, when he ate the fruit, that's when they both their eyes were opened and they saw they were naked. So the fall only came when man ate the fruit. When woman ate the fruit, nothing happened. But when man ate the fruit, something happened. The importance of authority. You understand it? When the authority falls, then the people are in trouble. You understand that? But if a follower falls, it's much, it's much lighter. So the enemy always tries to get to the authority of the king. So here was uh, Haman, gets to the king to influence him. But praise the Lord, this time a woman was used well, who was Esther. But prayer and fasting was made. You understand? There was prayer and fasting by Mordecai to say, we are praying for you. Go to the king and influence him. Isn't it? 
And she said, I can't just go to the king. If he doesn't accept me, I can be killed. But if he accepts me, if he accepts me, I can live. So they were praying and fasting all the Jews and interceding, you know, that the king will have mercy on Esther when she comes with the request. And Esther came in and the solution came through. We even see it um, in the time of Babylon when uh, Daniel uh, and his three, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now remember, these were the wise men. They were the choice people who were taken from Israel to come and serve in Babylon. The wise men, isn't it? The same wise men who were the wise men who came when Jesus was born. So these were the wise guys who were taken uh, to serve in the kingdom of Babylon. And remember the first time King Nebuchadnezzar made that big uh, statue, said everyone must worship it. Whoever doesn't worship it is thrown in the fiery furnace. And the three Hebrew boys said we're not going to bow down to worship it. So the decree of the king was made. Even those were, these were some of his best advisors, he had to say, right, into the fire they go. You understand that? But when he saw that they were saved, it caused him to make a decree. Let's read that one. It's uh, Daniel 3. Daniel 3, I believe. This is, let's read that one. After he saw what happened, that they were saved um, from the fiery furnace, he made another decree. So his first decree was to worship him and worship his, his golden image, which was made in his image. And then when he saw that these guys said, we're not going to bow, he saw something happen. This is what he said. Daniel 3 verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore I make a decree <laughs> that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. <laughs> you see that? Then they were promoted. So by them standing to say, okay, we're not going to go against this thing. Maybe they were interceding for the king whilst they were or when they came out of the fire or when they were in the fire i don't know maybe they would have said lord have mercy on this king he doesn't know what he's doing and then the king changed his mind and said right okay even though i made a golden image for everyone to worship now i just feel like uh we gotta worship your guys god look at that so one second is a demonic monster and the next moment he's the one of he's made a decree that everyone must worship god you see he's like changed the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord as the rivers of water turns it wherever he wants it to go. So it's important to keep on interceding for your leaders. You know, I haven't heard of modern day, okay, maybe it's done in a different way where the president makes an image for everyone to worship, whether it's econ economy or whatever, going against the, or, or medicine, going against the things of God, but then immediately changes, right? No, everyone must go to church. Can you believe it? I, I remember, I think it was, uh, there was a nation in Europe there was so much, uh, f uh, so much thing about football that they said they're going to remove football from Sunday. And I think they did it. Where they said no football games to be played on a Sunday, no soccer on a Sunday. People must go to church. And the president made that, made that law. I believe he did. And then no one, there was no soccer match on Sunday. So people can go to church. You see, these kind of things can be done. And then uh, it happened again with Daniel. Again, it was... These, remember this king had these advisors. So some were witch doctors and whatever and all that and spiritists. And then this side were these Jewish guys who also had their wisdom. So he wanted both advice to say, okay, guys, we have a problem. What do you say? What do you say? The dark spirits and then the Jewish guys were the light spirits, isn't it? Daniel and, and, the, and the, the rest of the wise men. Then when they saw they were jealous of Daniel, these wicked guys. Again, it's, it's two spirits at work. You understand? And they were like, no, Daniel is a problem. Uh, then they said, we can only find, we can find no fault against him except how he worships his Lord. Then they said, right, let's cause uh, the king to make a decree, right, that whoever bows down or gives worship to anyone else except for the king, he'll be thrown in the lion's den. And then they obviously, Daniel continued praying, even though that decree was made, maybe he was even praying for the king. I think I believe he was praying for the king because he even would say, Oh, king, live forever whenever he addressed the king. So I'm sure he continued to intercede for the king to say, Lord, let him change this, this uh, decision. We cannot bow to him as a man. We cannot pray to him as a man. We cannot worship to him as a man, isn't it? And then uh, this was King Darius, isn't it? 
Daniel 6 verse 9. Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So it doesn't give us the details of what he prayed, but I'm pretty sure that he was praying for the king. And he did it with his windows open so that people can see. It's like he wanted to prove a point that I'm going to keep on praying. Like how the Hebrew boys remained standing. When the trumpet was blown, they just looked at the statue. They didn't bow to it. They remained standing strong. That's why Ephesians says, having done all to stand, stand. So they remained standing strong. Maybe they were praying. They're saying, Lord, then God help this king. He's doing a foolish thing. We will not bow down to worship. Isn't it? And then once again, like we said, once a king makes a decree, it can't be stopped. So later on, we read here, uh, they call the king, right? And Daniel 6 verse 16. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, The God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Isn't it? And the stone was brought and laid upon. So it's like the king. Okay, wait, let's take this from above. I want to take it from Daniel 6 uh, verse number 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, they were telling him what Daniel had done. Then the king, when he heard these words, was so displeased in himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Let me take this from an easier translation. Right. God's word version. Daniel 6 verse 14. The king was very displeased when he heard this. He tried every way he could think of to save Daniel. And till sundown, he did everything he could to rescue him. Then Daniel's accusers gathered in front of the king. They said to him, Remember your majesty, the Medes and Persians have a law that no decree or statute that the king makes can be changed. So the king gave an order and Daniel was brought to him and thrown into the lion's den. The king told Daniel, May your God whom you always worship save you. Right? And they threw him into the thing. Right? Then in the morning, Daniel was saved. As in, you are still alive. And then Daniel 6 verse 23. It says, The king was overjoyed and had Daniel taken out from the den. When Daniel was taken out from the den, people saw that he was completely unharmed because he trusted his God. Verse 24. The king ordered those men. Look at this. <laughs> the king ordered those men who had brought charges against Daniel to be brought to him. They, their wives and their children were thrown into the lion's den. Before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions attacked them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to the people of every province, nation and, and language all over the world, I wish you peace and prosperity. I decree that in every part of my kingdom, people should tremble with terror in front of Daniel's God, the living God who continues forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His power lasts to the end of time. He saves, rescues and does miraculous signs and amazing things in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from the lions. This man, Daniel, prospered during the reign of Darius, the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So you see that. I believe it was through Daniel's intercession and prayer, first of all, for the authority uh, in the nation, which caused this change, isn't it? I'm showing the lion's den. He continued even to pray to say, Lord, when I get out of here, help that king. And the king there, again, made the decree who worshipped in the court of Daniel. That's it. So understand this, first of all, Prayers, intercessions be made for kings, all those in authority, that we can live a life of peace. So pray for your pastor, pray for your leader. And I showed you what to do. You can go back and watch. If you say, hey, but there's a big story, there's an issue. I showed you how to deal with that thing, you know, because the Lord, he wants his kingdom to keep flowing. Even your nation, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now the peace of Jerusalem, remember Jerusalem means city of peace. That Jerusalem, and it means the city wherein you live. Let's see if I can find that scripture. I want you to understand it. Because what has happened uh, is many people, they are often thinking it's making reference uh, to, to the nation. You understand? Psalms 122 verse number 6, right? Let's get it from the King James. Right. It says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Okay. So, even though at that time it was, you know, that psalm, or I believe it was of King David, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, the song of King David. So he was saying, pray for your city, for the peace of the city. 
and it was even called city of peace. So it means even your city, pray for peace and prosperity in the place where you live. Right? If you're hearing this thuggering and robbery and all that, pray for the peace in that city. And the best way to do it is to pray for your leaders, the ones with authority to bring things into line. Starting with the church leaders, kingdom of God leaders, and then all your governors, your mayor, and all that. Pray they make decisions to, to be in line with the, the gospel. Hallelujah. So God bless you. If this blessed you, just give it a like, comment, share it with someone, subscribe. Uh, remember, uh, Tuesday, first Tuesday of the month, I bring you a powerful testimony. Every Monday, I bring you a motivation word here motivation message every Wednesday I bring you this Wednesday weekly word hallelujah and then if you have questions send them to me the one which I get the most questions asked I will upload a video on Friday with the answer to your question if you have not yet received Jesus Christ say the prayer to follow love you so much God bless you and remember your heavenly father he loves you even more amen thank you thank you for listening thank you for watching if you haven't received salvation in Jesus Christ say this prayer with me right now just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I believe that you died for me and that you rose from the dead. I declare that I am saved and born again. I am your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Subscribe and follow on social media platforms, on YouTube, The Word of Truth, Jason Paul Pullen, on all your podcasting platforms, The Word for Today with Jason Pullen, Spotify, Audible, Acast, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can also follow us on Instagram, The Word of Truth JC. You can follow us on Facebook, The Word of Truth JC. You can follow us on Twitter at The Word of underscore Truth. There's free books available in the link below as well as on Amazon.com. If you'd like to partner with me, you can go to PayPal, paypal.me forward slash jpj or via scroll jpjs at gmail.com send an email the word of truth publications at gmail.com thank you for listening thank you for watching god bless you amen